There we go. All right. Yes. So we had just started osmosis, right? We've been, so we kind of worked our way through membranes, membrane structures, proteins and membranes, all that stuff. Right. And then we talked about passive transport, right? Which is just kind of moving things across those membranes without spending any energy. Right. We talked about diffusion, right? That things will just move from where they're kind of in a high concentration to where they're in a low concentration. Right. And within cells and membranes, we've got proteins that kind of facilitate that process. So the idea of facilitated diffusion, right? Where proteins are kind of helping things diffuse down their concentration gradient. Right. And then kind of the next thing we got to was this idea of kind of looking at this movement of stuff across membranes, kind of from like a water's perspective, in a way, it's a way kind of to think about this, right? Because your cytoplasm, right, your cells, all the stuff that's in them, right, is water-ish with, it's like water-ish with stuff in it, basically, right? We're mostly kind of living things are water with stuff dissolved in them and floating around in them. So in kind of the chemistry sense, right, that's an aqueous solution. It's water with stuff dissolved and floating around in it, where the water is the solvent and all of the stuff in your cytoplasm are the solutes, right? So we can kind of look at this from, again, from that kind of chemistry perspective um, and look at the behavior of stuff in cells with that in mind. So we can talk about osmosis, which is the diffusion of water across membranes, that's what we've been talking about, right? toward higher solute concentration. So kind of think of water moving kind of the inverse of the way the solutes do, right? If solutes can cross a membrane, they go from their high concentration to their low concentration. Conversely, if the solutes are stuck and the water is moving, the water is going to go to the high concentration of the solutes, right? And I think this is about where we got to on Monday where we're kind of looking at this example situation where we've got some constructed environment, right, with the semi-permeable membrane that will allow the water to move, but not the stuff in the water. So if we've got sugar in both halves of this container, and the concentration of sugar is higher here, what the water molecules are basically, I don't want to give them agency, but like what they're wanting to do, what the tendency of the water molecules is, is to distribute themselves equally around all molecules. So right now they're not, right? There's a lot more water molecules floating around this one sugar molecule than over here. So the osmosis is going to be the water moving to the other side so that now the water is more evenly distributed, right? All of these molecules are more evenly distributed and subsequently doing as much hydrogen bonding as possible. That's kind of the behavior that's driving this, right? So you get this water moving towards the higher solute concentration, right? And this becomes really important in living stuff because we're kind of just a giant system of aqueous solutions and semi-permeable membranes, right? It's a really kind of weird definition of a living thing, but it is what we are, right? And this is facilitated by aquaporins, right? Another one of these membrane proteins that's allowing water to move back and forth, right? Because water is polar, it can't go through the lipid bilayer. So it's got to have its own little channels. So these aquaporins are what's doing that, right? So, We can talk about kind of the osmotic behavior of water by comparing kind of the solutions in a given system. There we go. Right? So we're talking about osmotic concentration, which is the concentration of all solutes in some solution. Right? So I have this beaker of stuff and it's got some osmotic concentration. Whatever, everything that's in it, what is the concentration of just all the stuff? Right? And so we can compare different solutions using a few different terms, right? So hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic are the terms in question. And as an example, we're gonna use red blood cells, right? So we have red blood cells and we can put them in say, we'll just pretend each of these beakers has this kind of a solution relative to the red blood cell, right? So we've got red blood cells, we're gonna place them in solutions that have different osmotic concentrations, right? Because these words, and we'll kind of see this as we talk through them, are, they're comparative words. We'll unpack that. So let's start with hypertonic. So if I take my red blood cells and I drop them in a beaker that is full of solutes, 
has a really, really, really high concentration of solutes. Right? We'll say that red blood cells, just for the sake of making comparisons, just kind of have like a, a mediumish concentration of solutes. Then the liquid that I've put them in is hypertonic relative to the blood cells. Right, the solution has a higher solute concentration than the red blood cells. So if I have water and solutes inside the cells, water and solutes outside the cells, but the higher solute concentration is outside the cells, what is the water going to do? Yeah, the cells are going to shrivel up because the water is going to leave, right? The water in the cells is going to move to the higher solute concentration, which is in the liquid we put them in, right? So they'll shrivel up. Yeah. Are doing this based around the salt in the cell? Um, it doesn't really matter, right? Because when we're talking about osmotic, it's just all of the everything that's in the cell. So the, the proteins, the, the whatever is dissolved inside the cell. So it, it could be anything. It could be anything in the liquid we're putting in it, technically. Um, right, no, we're not gonna like pick apart what the various solutes are, just to know like, in this case, there's more in what we put them in than are inside the cells themselves. So we call the solution hypertonic. Right. Conversely, you could put them in a hypotonic solution. So be this case, right? So this could be well, any low solute concentrate. It could just be plain water. It could have like nothing in it for that matter, right? In which case, right, the liquid inside the cells is hypertonic relative to the solution they're in. Right, you see that? So these are they're comparative words. So if you have a hypertonic solution, right, the environment inside the cell is hypotonic relative to the solution, right? Because it's got a lower concentration of solutes. Here we have the opposite situation. We've got this hypotonic solution, low concentration of solutes, and we put our red blood cells in. Now what is the water going to do? What's it going to have to do to try and equal out? Where is it going to go? Yeah, it's going to go into the cells, right? Because the cells are now hypertonic in the system. They have more solutes. The water is going to try to distribute itself equally, right? By going into the red blood cells, right? Because if you put more water in the red blood cells, technically the concentration of solutes is going down relative to the volume of the cell. But unfortunately, if this happens to your red blood cells, they will eventually just burst. Right, because they'll just keep filling up with water and then they'll just pop. Right. That's if you put red blood cells in a hypotonic, a strongly hypotonic solution. Right, which leaves the third option, which would be isotonic, which is where both solutions, the, whatever is inside the cell and whatever is outside the cell, have the same osmotic concentration. You've got the same kind of concentration of solutes outside the cells as you do inside, right? And this is what your body wants, right? Your body wants things to be nice and even. It doesn't want things shriveling up. It doesn't want things bursting, right? Ideally, your body is maintaining some homeostatic environment, right? Where your red blood cells maintain the shape that they need to be to do the functions that they need to do, right? So isotonic, the concentrations are the same, both inside the cell and in the solution that you've got the cells in. Okay. All right. So we can talk about osmotic concentration. We can compare osmotic concentrations. We can also talk about osmotic pressure, right? In that hypotonic situation where the red blood cell is taking on water, right? As more and more water comes into the cell, the water is pushing on the plasma membrane, right? It's putting pressure on the plasma membrane. Right. And so you can have this idea of osmotic pressure. So technically there would be a point if whatever the cell was held in was strong enough, there's amount of pressure that you could stop osmosis from happening or the cell couldn't swell up anymore. 
the force needed to stop osmosis is osmotic pressure. Unfortunately, a red blood cell, your plasma membranes aren't strong enough, right? The pressure of osmosis of the water moving is going to burst the cell. But you've got cells like plant cells, right? That have a cell wall, right? If a red blood cell, if your plasma membrane was just kind of like a balloon, right? You're like you're filling a water balloon, it'll eventually burst. If the water balloon is in a box and you fill it up, there's eventually gonna be a point where you can't get any more water in it, right? Because the, por the force of the box pushing back will be stronger. I mean, unless you do something crazy and explode the box, right? But the box has enough force, has enough strength in it, right? To create that osmotic pressure to just kind of hold the cell steady. And this is what plant cells can do with their cell wall. They can handle that high osmotic pressure. The plasma membrane just kind of pushes out and fills against the cell wall. And then it just holds, right? There'll be a point where it can't take on any more water. All right, I can't spell, that's fine. All right, osmotic balance. It's really bugging me. I'm gonna change it over here. Honestly, I think I misspelled it on all these slides. That's fine, you know what I mean, osmotic balance. So, kind of like with the red blood cell example, your body living systems, right, need to be able to maintain osmotic balance, to maintain kind of the integrity of, of your cells, right? Whether you're single-celled or multi-celled, you've got to be able to kind of maintain some kind of osmotic balance. So there's a few ways that organisms do this. The first one is extrusion. You see this in a lot of single-celled stuff, right? You're a little amoeba or something, a little paramecium, and you get dropped in a hypotonic solution and you start taking on water, right? You, don't, you want to avoid exploding as a general rule, as a living organism, you want to avoid exploding. And so they have these structures called contractile vacuoles, which is basically a way for them to, to extrude, to remove, to bail out water. So if they're in some environment and they start taking on water, they have these little organelles, right? Connected to their cell wall with a little pore and they can basically start pumping out water if they start taking on too much. If they get in a solution or into an environment where the water is hypotonic relative to themselves, right? It's kind of like a little pump that pushes extra water out. If you're not single-celled, you've got some other options. We have a few methods of what is called isosmotic regulation, right? So we're talking about kind of maintaining consistent osmotic pressure. Iso means same, right? So regulating your osmotic pressures by kind of making them all the same, basically. You see this in marine organisms where they actually kind of adjust the concentration of solutes in their own body to match the seawater. Right? So they kind of evolved to match the environment that they exist in because they exist in an aqueous environment, right? They're surrounded by solutes, right? In the ocean, it's salty. Right, so marine organisms kind of adjust their internal concentrations to match the seawater so that their cells kind of stay structurally sound, basically, All right? We don't exist in aqueous solution, but we contain lots of aqueous solutions separated by membranes internally. And so in your kind of terrestrial system, your cells are getting bathed in isotonic solutions, right? So like your blood contains high solute concentrations of albumin, right? To make sure that your red blood cells don't start like taking on loads of liquid from the stuff around them in your blood, right? So your body kind of bathes, th bathes things, structures and isotonic solutions to kind of maintain that osmotic pressure. Right? So this idea of isosmotic regulation, right? Just keeping all of the osmotic concentrations the same in a system. Last one kind of refers back to that plant situation we were just looking at. Plant cells are hypertonic. Conversely means plants tend to like to be in a hypotonic environment that makes their cells hypertonic, right? This leads to high turgor pressure, right? So they want to take on lots of water. And so they fill all their plasma membranes 
to near bursting or what would be bursting if they didn't have cell walls to keep them from bursting, right? So this plasma membrane pushes against the cell wall and that's actually part of what gives plants structure, right? They don't have skeletons or anything like that, right? So they create this turgor pressure by pushing the plasma membrane, taking on as much water as possible, pushing their plasma membranes against the cell wall, kind of maintaining their shape that way, right? And this is why plants wilt when they're not watered. The plant is not in a hypotonic environment, isn't able to take on lots and lots of water. It can't maintain that turgor pressure. The plasma membrane kind of comes away from the cell wall and the plant just kind of, it wilts, right? Can't stand up anymore. Right, so they actually kind of plants in a weird way, especially plants that are not succulents, but plants that are more herbaceous, I guess, right? Actually rely on kind of being a bit out of osmotic balance. Interesting. All right. So talk a lot about passive transport, diffusion, facilitate diffusion, osmosis, all of that good stuff. But sometimes, We've got to expend a little energy to move stuff where we need it to go. Right, so we're going to talk a bit about active transport, um, give a couple examples of active transport in the cell. So passive transport is always moving things down their concentration gradient, right? We're not expending energy, so it kind of requires that basically whatever we're moving, we're rolling it downhill, right? From high concentration to low concentration. So there are times in a cell though, where you've got to push things back against their concentration gradient, right? And this takes energy, ATP in most cases, right? We've got to use energy to move things against their concentration gradient, right? From low to high concentration. So it's going to need ATP and we're going to need some specific proteins, right? To do this work for us. And so we've got these protein carriers that are going to move things against their concentration gradient. And we can kind of separate them into three separate things, basically. We can talk about different kinds of porters, right? Porters are, you know, like, you don't really have porters around anymore, but like people who carry your bags around, like things that move stuff around. So you can have a uniporter, and a uniporter just transports one kind of molecule, right? Uni means one. So if porter's moving, it's just moving one kind of thing transports a single type of molecule. You can have a sim porter, and sim means same. So sim porters can move two different kinds of molecules, but always in the same direction, right? And then lastly, we can have an anti-porter. So anti-porters also can move different kinds of molecules, like two different kinds of molecules, but only in opposite direction. So a sim porter might move two different things, but always say from inside to outside the cell or from outside the cell to inside the cell. An anti-porter is gonna move one thing out of the cell while it moves another thing into the cell. It's kind of like trading places with these molecules, moving one in and one out at the same time. All right, so we'll look at a couple examples. First example, sodium potassium pump. All right. Here we go. They run directly on ATP. So this is another, it's a six step process that kind of just runs in a cycle over and over again. And you have a lot of these pumps and they're running basically all of the time to the point that for every one of your cells, about a third of their energy is used just to run these pumps, right? And it's going to pump sodium outside of the cell and potassium into the cell. So two different things going in different directions. So this would be an example of an anti-porter, right? It's moving two molecules in opposite directions, anti-porter, right? So the basic process, side note, know this, right? The basic process is gonna happen. We've got this protein in the membrane, right? The sodium potassium pump, anti-porter protein right here. And so where we're starting, it's open to the inside of the cell. And when it's open to the inside of the cell, it's able to bind sodium, right? So we're going to bind an ATP, right? Because we're going to need to expend a little energy. And we're going to bind three sodium in this protein. When those bind, the ATP phosphorylates the pump. We'll get into kind of the details of what ATP has going on later. But ATP does what ATP does and powers up the pump to open to the outside, 
right? When it opens to the outside, it releases the sodium. Now that it's changed shape and it's open to the outside, it has space for potassium to bind. Potassium binds. When the potassium kind of attaches in, it causes this little phosphate group left over from the ATP to pop off, which causes the protein to shut again on the outside and open to the inside, releasing the potassium to the inside of the cell. And now we're back in that original state, open to the inside, and the whole thing starts over. We get the ATP and some sodium. ATP pops the protein open to the outside, release the sodium, get some potassium. Open it back to the inside, release the potassium in the inside. So this is just kind of happening all the time, right? Sodium's getting pushed out, potassium's getting pulled in just constantly, right? And what we're creating is a gradient, basically, right? We're making a high concentration of sodium out here and a high concentration of potassium in here. So that, for a reason, your cell can then do coupled transport. Right, so we've got transport in the sodium potassium pump that directly uses ATP, push sodium out, pull potassium in. So we basically talk about the transport of cells when we're talking about the sodium potassium pumps and then we're talking about the public. So we're transporting, in this case, ions, ions in and out of the cell. So sodium out of the cell, potassium into the cell, right? Which allows this other protein over here, this is a coupled transport protein, to use this gradient to move other things, right? So it's relying on another protein using ATP. So it still technically needs energy to be working, but we call it indirect because it's not using the ATP itself. So, so the potassium pump is making a gradient. We've got all this sodium out here, right? And so now sodium is going to naturally move back down its gradient. Right? And this coupled transport protein is able to use this gradient as this sodium comes through to pull glucose along in it. So you're able to pull glucose into the cell, right? Your cells need glucose, to make energy, to make more ATP to run the pump, actually, right? And so it will pull sodium and glucose in together, right? And so it's coupled transport because it only works kind of in conjunction with the sodium potassium pump, right? If the sodium potassium pump's not doing what it needs to do, that protein can't do anything either, right? But it's creating this gradient over here at the pump, allowing us to pull glucose into the second protein. Now, the second protein is pulling two different things, sodium and glucose, inside the cell in the same direction. So it's an example of a symporter. Right. Sodium potassium pumps an antiporter, moving sodium and potassium in opposite directions. This protein that's using that gradient is moving sodium and glucose in the same direction, making it a symporter. All right. We've got kind of two examples here, right? One that's using ATP directly. One that is indirect active transport, relying on the other protein's use of ATP, mm -hmm. right? So that'll wrap us up for active transport. We've got one more section in chapter five. And I'll have us done with chapter five and we'll just have my tips left basically. So chapter five, we're gonna talk about bulk transport. We've basically been talking about kind of like moving monomers, right? Smaller molecules or ions and other things through. But occasionally your cell needs to take in big stuff, big macromolecules, big organic matter things. So we'll talk about how bulk transport works. So endo and exo, cytosis are kinds of bulk transport. So they're gonna move large things, big polar molecules, big kind of organic objects into and out of a cell or across a membrane. So this idea of bulk transport. So start with endocytosis, right? Cyto, we talked about this kind of root here. Cyto just means cell 
endo means inside. So endocytosis is bringing stuff inside the cell. So what generally happens in all of these is that the plasma membrane is going to fold around something, kind of pinch off and bring it into the cell, right? So we've got a few different ways this will happen, right? If the thing being brought in is a big particulate solid thing, right? Large organic matter or another organism, right? If your little single cell organisms is basically how you eat, right? They'll wrap up things like bacterial cells in plasma membrane pull them into the cell that way right? and then digest them later, right? That's phagocytosis, okay? This is when we talked about endosymbiotic theory, this is the process that they think kind of led to us having mitochondria, plants having chloroplasts, all that kind of stuff, was that phagocytosis happened, the cell was taken in, but then never digested. It was like incomplete phagocytosis, right? If, a large amount of stuff being taken in is generally liquid with some solutes in it. It's called penocytosis, right? So, right, we can take these little ions and things in singly through little pumps, but maybe a cell for whatever reason just needs like a whole heck ton of it at once, right? Then penocytosis, this process allows the cell, right, the membrane to kind of wrap around whatever kind of batch of solutes it needs and pull it into the cell, right? So, Phagocytosis for large solid stuff, penocytosis for liquid. And then occasionally, option three, a cell needs to be a bit picky about what it's bringing in, right? And so if we want to do some specific endocytosis, we can do receptor mediated endocytosis, which just means we have a receptor that's guiding the endocytosis. So we've got these receptors, these little proteins that are ready to bind two things that we need to pull into the cell, maybe a big macromolecule of some sort, right? In this case, right, kind of the example we're talking about here is low density lipoprotein, which is what we use to pull cholesterol into the cell. Cholesterol is something you need when you're making membranes, right? In between all those little phospho and sphingolipids, right? So we can have these low density lipoproteins, these receptor proteins that will target a molecule. And then basically kind of that phagocytotic process just happens again, right? The membrane's gonna close around and pull that specific molecule in as opposed to just kind of some large something. All right. So those are all ways of getting stuff into the cell, getting stuff out of the cell, we just kind of lump all together makes it nice and easy. Exocytosis, right? Exo, like exit, which is getting stuff out of the cell. And it's basically just all of those endocytosis processes in reverse, right? And so this is where we see those secretory vesicles that the Golgi apparatus was giving off earlier, getting secreted, right, by this process. So these secretory vesicles that are released from the transface of the Golgi, right, come up they fuse with the plasma membrane and then open up to the outside and then whatever they're holding, hormones or excess water, waste, whatever that needs to be released is released to the outside of the cell. And so that's exocytosis. We just kind of lump all of that together. We don't get any more particular than that. All right, so we can discharge stuff, waste or chemical signals or what have you from vesicles at the surface of the cell. All right, and I think, yeah. So that's the end of chapter five. So let's see, let's, we'll go through part of this. We won't finish this up on Friday, but let's see how much we remember from the first chunk of chapter five. All right, a little brief review. All right, so we talked about, we started this chapter, remember, with the fluid mosaic model. Right. So the fluid mosaic model said that membranes are generally made lipid bilayer and proteins. We talked about two different kinds of proteins, peripheral and integral membrane proteins. What's the difference between peripheral and integral membrane proteins? 
Hmm? Yeah, the peripheral ones are the ones that use those anchors because where are they actually located? In or on? Yeah, right. Yeah, they tend to have those lipid anchors that hold them on it, and then they're actually out on the periphery of the membrane, right? Kind of on the surface versus integral membranes, which are exactly embedded in the membrane. All right, so we're talking about all of these chunks of things that are in membranes. So we kind of talked about four components, four kind of groups of things we see in membranes. What are the four component groups of the cell membrane that we listed? Mm -hmm. Yep, the phospholipid bilayer. Transmembrane proteins, which are integral, a type of integral protein. Yep, the interior protein network and Yep, and those cell surface markers, yeah, those kind of name tag things hanging off the outside of a cell. So we have these four kind of component groups that are all working together to build up these cell membranes. And then we talked about six functions of membrane proteins. What are some things that these membrane proteins are doing? Transport, transport's a huge one, right? We've just spent like two days talking about transporting stuff across a membrane and it's all done by proteins. Yeah, what up? Enzymes, right? They're carrying on chemical reactions in and around the membrane. Yeah. Yep, receptors are taking in kind of chemical and physical signals from the outside to the inside of the cell. Yep, those cell surface kind of identifying Proteins, yep, that was another one. Adhesion, yep, they're attaching cells to other cells. And, and the cytoskeleton, those fibers that are kind of giving the whole thing structure and shape. Yep, absolutely. All right. Three components of a phospholipid. I'm chapter three and chapter five together now. What are the main parts of a phospholipid? Phosphate, yeah. They can be saturated or unsaturated. And what part, what component is that talking about? What piece of the phospholipid? No worries. What were those? In the phospholipids, there's two of them, two long. Not a protein, not yet, we haven't gotten a protein. So phospholipids, we've got phosphate with some little organic something on the top of it. What's, what's the bottom half then? Yep, yeah. so we've got phosphate group, we've got this little guy that has too long lit attached to it. You're welcome to chime in Zoom. Oh, is it the bottom layer? That's what they're gonna make. We're gonna get to the bilayer. Are they dealing with the junctions? Nope, not the junctions. Glycerol is one of them, right? The phosphate's attached to a glycerol, and from the glycerol, we've got these two long molecule parts. They can be saturated or unsaturated. No. Long fatty acid. fatty acid tails, right? The long fatty acid tails, the big hydrocarbon chains, right? So the non-polar hunk. So we've got like the polar hunk, right? The phosphate and whatever is attached to it. And we've got the glycerol and the two fatty acid tails. There's our phospholipid. And how do they spontaneously form membranes? Why do membranes form? Because of hydrophobic exclusion, right? Because what's happening? What is 
Well, the water is pushing it away. It's pushing what part away? I mean, I guess it is technically a solute, but what part of the phospholipids getting is the water like saying no to? The phosphate end or the other end? The, yeah, the fatty acid tail part, right? Because it's nonpolar, it's just a hydrocarbon chain. There's nothing charged about it. So the water pushes it away, right? Causing them to all kind of come together in this big sheet because they've all been pushed away from the water. Those polar heads are on the outside and we get our lipid bilayer. Then I wrote a question twice. All right, passive transport. How do we define passive transport? Yeah, yeah, passive transport is transporting things across membranes without using energy, right, or ATP. Which was, what was our, what is the term for that, right? Things moving down there, right? It's moving down its concentration gradient. That's how we get around using energy. And what do we call that process of things moving down their concentration gradient? Yep, 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 diffusion. All right, what was osmosis then? It's another kind of passive transport. Wait. Absolutely. Yes, water moving across some semi permeable membrane to where there's a higher concentration of solutes. So up the concentration of solutes. Or down the concentration of water, I guess, technically. Yes, if you want to think about it that way. All right. We have time to walk through this. We can walk through this kind of quick. How does a sodium potassium pump work? Maybe just generally. We'll do this one generally. That'll be enough. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you've got a pump open to the inside, uses ATP to move sodium out, brings potassium in, right? And it's just kind of doing that over and over again. All right. Oh yeah, describe a method of bulk transport. We'll just pick one. Just pick one and define it. Bulk transport. So moving big things or lots of things. Endocytosis. What is what is a way that endocytosis works? Or what is generally happening in endocytosis? Maybe just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the plasma membrane unfolds something, pulls it into the cell. Big hunks of stuff, whole cells, whatever needs to come in, right? Wraps it up in the membrane, brings it into the cell. All right, so that is good for today. Um, unit assignment is open. We'll meet up on Friday, start chapter 10. Knock out the last chunk of stuff for next week's exam. Don't forget about snap groups. Um, yeah. It's like, yeah, like a point per week. Basically. If you go to a snap group each week, you'll get a point per week. You're welcome to go to as many as you like. As much as they're helpful. I do have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Um,